All right, we're about three after 8.30, so we'll go ahead and get going. Um, Atsuta Sunalai, Carly Hotbed, Dakwadoa, Chi Chalagi, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Jigega, Osio Nagad. Good morning, my name is Carly Hotbed. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation um, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, hello, everyone. And um, I am here on behalf of the Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative. I'm the associate director out there, and I'm going to talk to you today about some ag policy and funding updates that could be applicable to your tribe and uh, what you need to know for Farm Bill 2023 so you don't miss out on any opportunities. So a little bit about us. Um, here's the agenda today. Um, we'll talk about policy updates, and then I'll go into Farm Bill um, work and Native Farm Bill Coalition priorities. We'll talk about marker bills and how you can participate. We'll also give an update about some things coming down from Department of Interior and then um, funding opportunities. And funding opportunities is always tough for me because I know about a lot of them, but I don't know what the timelines and time frames are for all of them. So I have a resource included in there um, for you all to check out um, at your own time. And then we'll open it up for questions and answers. So you may have spe some specific questions regarding Farm Bill policy about your tribe um, or operations. And we will go ahead and float those, and I will give you the caveat. I am an attorney. You might get the attorney answer. It depends, or I don't know. Let me go look it up, and I'll get back to you. Um, but we will try and make sure to get you as informed and educated on the process as possible. So um, that's me. Nobody cares about that. <laughs> um, IFAI. So we were founded at University of Arkansas School of Law in 2013 um, by our Dean Emeritus, Stacy Leeds, who is actually the dean now at um, Arizona State. So Mr. Miller that you heard speak yesterday, he talked about his book and the McGirt decision. Um, she's his dean now at his law school. So she went from Arkansas um, to Arizona State and we miss her very much. Um, and she's been a great mentor to me. Um, our founding director is Janie Sims Hip. Do you guys know where she's at now? USDA General Counsel. So um, Stacy is a citizen of Cherokee Nation. Janie is a citizen of Chickasaw Nation. So we have some good friends in high places, um, which is excellent for us this farm bill season. And so our mission at IFAI is to really enhance the health and wellness in tribal communities by first taking a look at healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and then making sure those cultural food traditions are acknowledged and respected in Indian country. We're your nerdy attorneys. Um, this is really specialized tribal ag law and policy work. And so our goal is to provide that legal analysis and that policy research to create educational resources to help you out when it comes to working in your tribe and how to empower your food sovereignty, your agriculture, and your economic development. And that can look like a variety of different options and we can talk about those after if you wanna visit. We also do direct um, tribal consultations. We will come to your location, sit down with you and talk about whatever ag project or topic you wanna focus on and uh, give you some pointers or tips or directions or opportunities or funding supports and help you get going in the direction that you wanna head in. So this is just a sample of some of the work that we do. We do house the model tribal food and ag code. We are the policy and research partner for the Native Farm Bill Coalition. We work in food safety, food sovereignty, helping you scale up. Um, we also have resources to help you develop your own tribal department of agriculture, if that's something your tribe is interested in. A lot of tribes are already working in agriculture, land management, natural resources, food systems, nutrition work. A department of ag creates an umbrella that all of those programs can live under and work together. And then we also have youth programming opportunities as well. So what is the Native Farm Bill Coalition? Um, NFBC, uh, this is our executive board or our governing body. So Intertribal Ag Council, us at IFAI, the National Congress of American Indians, and the Shakopee, Mdewakanton Sioux community. Um, we all come together and are kind of um, the executive decision makers, but we don't make decisions just based on what these four organizations think is the best thing to do. I spent all last year on the road. I did 50,000 miles in, in the air, and I don't know how many more on the ground doing outreach um, to go to your communities across the United States and get feedback from stakeholders saying, what's working for you, what's not working for you, what can we learn about? And we put that all into a big report called Gaining Ground, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but there's 150 policy priorities um, for recommended changes to the Farm Bill to better serve Indian country. So what even is the Farm Bill? It's a huge, omnibus, multi-year law that, be, that Congress uses as a vehicle to set the priorities for the U.S. food and ag sector. This is the second largest bill that Congress passes. And it's usually enacted fi every five years. I say usually because Congress is going to do what Congress is going to do. And you may have heard from a presenter yesterday that um, we're not going to get a farm bill this year. Um, I am a little more optimistic than that. 
Um, but there is potential for disruption. Uh, but all of the uh, legislators that um, I'm aware of have been working very diligently in a bipartisan manner to try and get this done. So we're seeing significant forward progress, but it's still, I would say, somewhat early in the process. Um, we're at the front third, I would say, but kind of nearing the second third of if you're going to split it up into uh, three parts as far as how it goes through a, a congressional session. But why is Farm Bill important? Like I said, largest piece of legislation shaping food and ag policy. Over five years, $428 billion comes through the Farm Bill, um, which actually results in about, you know, almost not, $867 billion over 10 years, and that's commodities, crop insurance, conservation, trade. You'll see nutrition is the biggest chunk of that. That includes your FDIPA program or your commods program. That's SNAP, that's elder nutrition. Um, school lunch programs, the childhood nutrition programs, those are actually not included in this funding package. That's a separate bill. Um, the nutrition portion is going to be the most contentious. There's always some sort of discussion about SNAP, whether it should continue to be in the farm bill or be separated from that, um, what the requirements to access SNAP are, um, and SNAP is essentially um, what used to be known as food stamps. But why is this important? USDA, through the farm bill, is the largest funder of Indian country. More than IHS, more than BIA, more than DOI combined. Four billion dollars annually comes from Farm Bill programs to Indian country. The next highest, I think, is IHS at like 2.2 billion. Even if you float out the nutrition portion, the Farm Bill titles that hit Indian country, 2.1 billion dollars. So there is a ton of money coming through here, and if you're not paying attention, your tribe might be missing out on some really good opportunities. So these are the titles in the Farm Bill. Um, we have 12 titles. And we'll talk a little bit about what's in some of those titles. Um, but research, that includes your education components, your tribal land grant. Um, nutrition, like I said, is for dipper. Credit, if you need an FSA loan um, to buy or operate a farm or a ranch, that's where you can access that. And then uh, disaster relief programs are under commodities and conservation, as well as other types of conservation programs. And then rural development's a big one as well for infrastructure, um, especially uh, broadband. So those are just some of the highlights. So what's the Farm Bill timeline? Our current Farm Bill from 2018 is going to expire on September 30th. And Congress has until the end of 2023 before it needs to pass a continuing measure. So that gap between September 30 and December, there's allocated funds that allow it to operate, um, continue to operate um, as a reflection of what was previously existing. But we got to have a new Farm Bill soon. If we do pass a continuing resolution, not every program in Farm Bill is going to receive funding. Um, it's a matter of which funding is discretionary, which is mandatory. Like for example, the dairy margin program is not going to receive funding if there's a continuing resolution. So um, right now, it's time. House and Senate Ag Committees are currently holding hearings and listening sessions and presenting marker bills. Those marker bills are the legislation that gets slowed to be like, I like this thing, do you like this thing? Okay, let's pass it. And if it passes and it comes out of committee and you like it, it gets set aside to be included in the larger farm bill package. And so bill language for these marker bills is due to the House Ag Committee by the 24th. And the Senate Ag Committee, their original deadline was the 17th, but it got pushed to the end of this month. So what the Native Farm Bill Coalition does is based on those policy priorities, we support and help and provide draft or sample language to legislators who are interested in supporting uh, Native Farm Bill Coalition priorities. So they have the language. Even if we didn't draft it, um, Native Farm Bill Coalition didn't draft it, a lot of times these legislators and their staff will draft it and say, hey, can you look at this language and make sure it's okay for Indian country and doesn't have any problems or issues that need to be addressed. And so Native Farm Bill Coalition does that work. So all that to say, if there are priorities that you or your tribe are interested in when it comes to Farm Bill policies, now is the time to engage your elected officials. So how does it work? Um, starts out with citizen input. Congressional members conduct outreach to gather input. We also conducted outreach to gather input, compiled it in a report, and shared that information um, in a paper copy or an electronic copy to all of those um, congressional players who are on House Ag, Senate Ag, Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, House uh, Committee on Natural Resources, um, and all of the ones that have anything to do with things that touch the Farm Bill. And so it starts out with hearings, then it goes to the committees. Committees draft the bill. Um, both chambers have their own process that they go through. Um, 
the, uh, I have a really awesome typo on there. That's supposed to say debating markup and eventually voting for the bill before it makes it to the floor. And so committee to the floor, floor vote, and then House will pass the firm bill version, Senate will pass the firm bill version. They are never the same. And so it has to go to conference. And they have to sit down and say, okay, I have this in my bill and you don't, can we keep it in or does it need to come out? And so they go through and all the places where everything doesn't match, they decide what goes in, what stays out, or what needs to be changed to make it match up. And so once that happens and you have similar or identical versions, it goes back to each House, House and Senate to vote on for final passage, and then it goes to the White House for the President to sign to become law. We are, do I have a laser? No. We're between the uh, hearings and committee phase right now. So that's why I said we're in the first third of the game right now. <clears throat> so what are the policy priorities? So this is the Gaining Ground Report that was titled. It has over 150 policy priorities for Indian Country, and they focus on topics like food security, tribal sovereignty, economic development, natural resource stewardship, and rural infrastructure development. I've done some interviews with media wanting to know about Native Farm Bill Coalition policy priorities, and they're like, what are the top priorities for Indian country? I'm like, you can't ask me that, because there's 150. There are different ones that are going to be more important for some tribes, and different ones that will be more important for others. But we can like categorize them within these, three, within these five categories to kind of say, these are the goals that we're wanting to see improvements with. So what are some of the marker bills that are coming through that are, we're tracking and keeping an eye on? Some of these um, are more likely to pass and get support, some are less likely. Um, there's no guarantee that any of them are going to make it into the Farm Bill, but these are the ones that we're watching. Um, so authorizing tribes to develop priority resource concerns and conservation programs. Right now, only states have the authority to say what those priority resource concerns are, and some states don't even give tribes a seat at the table in helping to develop what those priority concerns are. So uh, what we heard from our um, tribal stakeholders was that tribes need to have the ability to list out what their own priority resource concerns are. You know, whether it's, um, sh you know, stream bank accretion mitigation, or we want to, um, you know, take a look at eliminating certain types of invasive species, or we need to improve our soil health, um, measure, you know, whatever those measures are that are important for your tribe and your land base, that's what needs to happen. Um, also, authorization for lands held in common to be eligible for NRCS programs. Currently, there's a gap in those lands that are held in common. Um, they're not eligible for NRCS programs. So if you have multiple um, land holders or um, something that's set up kind of like a trust land property, but you have multiple interest holders, um, getting everybody to sign up um, has been a historic challenge. And so treating lands held in common um, as eligible for these programs will help address some of the gaps in those conservation services. This one's a big one. Um, elevating the USDA Office of Tribal Relations director position to um, an, ass an assistant secretary position. So right now the director, um, of OTR, they're still they're housed in the uh, secretary's office, but this would bump that position up to an assistant secretary rather than a director, and would make it confirmed by Congress. And so um, it would uh, kind of solidify the position and give it an additional place of authority. And that elevation puts the uh, that, <coughs> the leader of that office of tribal relations more in direct um, contact with the secretary. Right now, Secretary Vilsack does treat um, that director position as having a direct line to him, and he works very closely with Heather Don Thompson, who's the director of Office of Tribal Relations. Um, but not every secretary has done that in previous administrations, so this would really solidify that type of relationship. In addition, um, there is discussion and a request about creating an Office of Self-Governance at USDA. One does not currently exist. Um, some programs under the 2018 Farm Bill that had been authorized for 638 opportunities, they're asking BIA to administer those programs because they do have an Office of Self-Governance. USDA is not familiar, as familiar with it, doesn't have a lot of experience or guidance doing it. But what that looks like is a chunk of money from every pot of funds that are allocated for um, programmatic administration has to go to BIA to help run these programs. And it doesn't make sense for USDA not just to be handling that in-house because it's not that hard, right? And so um, creating an Office of Self-Governance at USDA in the Office of the Secretary could theoretically fall under or mesh with that Office of Tribal Relations um, based on that subject matter knowledge already. And so that would um, support 
additional USDA 638 self-compacting and contracting. Uh, we've also seen 638 self-governance authorization for nutrition programs, forestry programs, um, and uh, some NRCS programs, and then the FSIS meat processing. So we saw some tribes either use their uh, pandemic relief funding to bring on meat processing facilities, but there's not um, a federal authorization or recognition that um, tribes have the ability to inspect their own meat products. So you either have to be state inspected or you have to be custom exempt or you have to be federally inspected. And so that 638 language for the meat inspection portion would create an opportunity for tribal parity and also create an opportunity for uh, 638 funding to actually do that inspection work. So theoretically, your tribe could be raising and producing its own livestock on reservation, processing on reservation, packaging and labeling on reservation, inspecting on reservation, and selling on reservation. So that meat product never has to leave your tribal community in order to hit the market or get into commerce. And so I think that's a great idea because it retains more dollars um, on your reservation rather than having to go off res to get those services. And that's coming through the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. Um, Senate Committee on Indian Affairs doesn't have direct authorization over ag programs, but they do work very closely with the Senate Committee on Agriculture because they know that agriculture priorities in Indian country are such a hot topic and there's a huge need there. Uh, we've also seen draft language about fixes to the drought monitor. Um, we know that the drought monitor doesn't always accurately reflect um, what the drought situation is on a county by county basis because you can have pretty big variations um, across counties. I'm especially thinking of some of the really big counties like in Arizona. Um, I know y'all who are from Arizona have those giant counties and you can have a lot of climatological difference from you know one end to the other um, versus some of the smaller counties like where I'm at in Oklahoma. Um, you know, we have 77 counties within that state alone, and so they're pretty small, and you get a little more consistency with what that weather um, or drought monitor um, information looks like. There's also going to be a study on barriers to conservation program enrollment on leased ag lands. So this one may be of particular interest. Um, this isn't just for tribally leased ag lands, it's for any leased ag lands and what the issues are there, but we already know that there are pretty significant challenges. Some uh, conservation programs require you to sign up for a 10-year contract to participate, and your BIA or your grazing, your tribal grazing lease may be 10 years. Or you, you have to have the lease in place before you sign up for the program, but by the time that you get your lease in place and start working on the paperwork to get signed up for the program, you're already short on your 10-year requirement. So there's been an acknowledgement that there needs to be more flexibility with those um, contract term links to better support um, uh, those ag leases, people, uh, the lessees who want to sign up for those programs. It also, there's also a bill that we were, we've been watching to prohibit the enrollment of land into CRP for a one-year moratorium and prevent enrollment of any prime farmland into CRP. I don't think that one's going to go very far. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if it has made it out of committee, uh, but that's one that was of concern. Um, and then uh, there's another bill, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, is to establish a community resilience and restoration fund um, that would be grant funded. And there's a $10 million set aside for tribes um, to engage in conservation efforts related to climate change. So we're watching that one because we're interested in it. Um, also, U.S. Forest Service uh, Good Neighbor Authority um, authorization for uh, tribal receipt, retention, and adjacent land restoration. So currently there's not a reimbursement or a funding opportunity for tribes that are doing that Good Neighbor Authority that are engaging in that agreement with um, U.S. Uh, Forest Service. And so this would create the opportunity for tribes to receive reimbursements and funding support um, if they're doing uh, land restoration next to that forest that they're in that Good Neighbor Authority with. Um, in order to have consistency of that management. Because we know when you're looking at natural resources, just because you have an, you know, this property line or the boundary line, it doesn't mean that all things stop there. Your invasive species are going to you know, cover that line. You're going to have you know, climate impacts, weather impacts, um, other types of natural resource, um, migration pattern issues that come across there. You know, wildlife doesn't care about your boundary line, right? So, having a consistency of how you're managing the forest land with the adjacent land, especially if it's tribal land, and being able to get funding support for that is something that's going to be, uh, we're excited to see come down the pipe. Uh, there's also a bill to talk about private sector partnerships to allow businesses to invest in conservation practices in the geographic region of their choice, and USDA will provide match funds. Um, if your tribe has a 
business arm that likes to use those funds to directly support certain projects or activities that or, or any private business if you have a good working relationship with a non-tribal business that wants to um, provide funding for a conservation practice or measure in your in your area USDA um, through this bill would provide matching funds for that so it bumps up um, opportunities it creates additional funding um, for conservation practices and measures um, the businesses like it because they get a shiny gold star about investing in conservation practices and being green and sustainable and the communities, especially, tri especially tribal communities, um, can prioritize their conservation projects that maybe don't necessarily fit as well into existing programs. So uh, that, that's a good one to keep an eye on. Um, the Meat and Poultry Special Investigator Act, there's a lot in this one. Um, fertilizer assistance and uh, acquisition and production. We heard that all the time, especially with price volatility um, last year with um, it, it's hard to get um, the fertilizer that you need, hard to get the inputs that you need to run your farm and your ranch the way that you need to. Um, we know that on reservation we tend to be a little more rural, we tend to be a little more remote, our transportation costs tend to be higher. And so um, providing assistance when we're looking at you know securing fertilizer either by acquisition or producing it ourselves is something that um, would be included in that bill. There's also a competition investigator. Um, and we talk about um, the Packer and Stalker Act or um, livestock programs. We know a lot of times there can be discriminatory practices in the industry. Um, we've heard all kinds of crazy stuff from different communities about how um, native livestock are treated in comparison to non-native livestock on reservation. And that competition investigator would be tasked with addressing those issues. Um, we also see that this would establish a USDA supply chain task force, create grants and loans to support meat processing, and establish supply chain resource centers for small and medium-sized producers. Um, this is going to be big for uh, Indian Country livestock producers if this is something that passes. We're watching this one very closely. And then the other one is creating a catalog of, or a library of contracts that are offered from packers to producers. So if you're selling your cattle or your livestock to a packer, and they're offering you terms that you don't like, you would have the ability to go to this catalog or library and look it up and see what other contracts that they or their competitors have offered to people. And so you have a little more negotiating power because you have the knowledge to say, no, I know that you bought um, so many head from my neighbor for this term at this price, this time frame, and um, you know, this quality, and I expect this similar treatment. So this can kind of help address some of those discriminatory practices in the industry. So those are some of the marker bills. What's going on with congressional hearings? <clears throat> We've had, there's been a lot that have happened so far, and I'm trying to focus on ones that are coming up or going to be happening soon. So the Senate Ag Budget and Appropriations Committee is going to be doing a hearing, which is a, will be a review of the President's um, fiscal year 2024 U.S. Forest Service budget. and so. Every year the President's office is tasked with putting together a budget um, for how these programs are going to run. And Congress usually says, thank you President, that's cute. <clears throat> We're going to do whatever we want to do anyway to put it together. And they have the ability to do that because Congress has the power of the purse. But the President's budget is informative because it identifies what the priorities are for the administration, what they're going to focus on when it comes to the different programs. So. Um, I like to say a budget is a moral document. It identifies where your values and your priorities are. And so the Senate Ag Committee is going to be reviewing that Forest Service budget, going through and making sure, um, I, you know, identifying what those priorities are and working through what their um, own priorities are for the Forest Service, especially if um, those senators represent districts that have significant interest in forestry. So they're going to go through and review that. Um, there's also, SCIA is the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. They're hosting a roundtable uh, today for native priorities for the 2023 Farm Bill reauthorization. Um, I don't have the link for that, but it should be available um, on the USDA website if you, or excuse me, not USDA website, but on the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs website. If you Google that, um, they'll have like a, a button for hearings and you should be able to pull that up if you wanna watch that later today. We have representatives um, from uh, tribal members who participate as Native Farm Bill Coalition members as well that are gonna be testifying. And so it's gonna cover everything from nutrition, conservation, um, you know, FSIS work. FSIS is, um, what is it, Will? Food Safety Inspection. Food Safety Inspection Service. 
And I feel like this is alphabet soup half the time, but y'all know that working in, you know, um, land management and resources. It's just acronym city around here. But um, in addition, there's a house of, uh, the House Appropriations Committee is host also hosting a hearing on the Forest Service budget on the 23rd. Um, they're probably going to be informed by what happens at the Senate Committee. Uh, because again, you need to know what one house is doing or what one chamber is doing and what the other chamber is doing. You can kind of identify where you're going to have um, hiccups. But all of the budget stuff has to originate in the house, so house kind of has the final say about what's going to go and what isn't. Um, the House Appropriations Committee um, is also having a hearing. Uh, they call it a member day, which is pretty much just an opportunity for each um, committee member on the House Appropriations Committee. Um, with regard to rural development, FDA, and other related topics to kind of just get on the record what their district's priorities are. I don't think there's going to be anybody testifying. It's just an opportunity for them to sit around the table, talk into a microphone, and say, this is what my district is looking for. Um, that's tomorrow at 10 Eastern. And then we also have the House Ag Subcommittee on, research, on Conservation Research and Biotechnology. There's a hearing on the USDA's implementation of research programs. This is a big deal. One of the things that we talked about um, and that we heard a lot from stakeholders last year when we were doing outreach was there's a need for um, better protocols on how to do ag research in land and natural resource research in Indian country. How to be compliant with our cultural values um, and also how to um, cooperate with the tribe and not just show up and you know, do extractive research where you know, somebody else comes in, gets the data, takes the data and leaves doesn't share it with the tribe, doesn't share it with the community, and doesn't make that information available even though tribal people and tribal lands are the basis of that research. So um, having a discussion there. Um, under the research title, uh, that also includes education. So your 1994 tribal land grant colleges, um, that's where their funding comes from. And if there's any additional need for support, we hope to hear about it in this hearing as well. More House Ag Subcommittee on Research um, Conservation Title. Uh, that was a duplicate entry, sorry. Um, House Natural Resources Federal Land Subcommittee. There's a hearing um, on a few bills, Forest Information Reform, Targeting Offsetting Existing Illegal Contaminants Act, Accurately Counting Risk Elimination Solutions Act, and then Forest Protection and Wildland Firefighter Safety Act. That Forest Protection and Wildland Firefighter Safety Act, I think a component of that discusses a pay raise um, increase and also bringing our tribal um, uh, fire uh, fighters uh, up to bring their salary up to par um, with other um, wildland firefighter groups in the area because currently there's a deficiency. So um, that's one that we're keeping an eye on as well. So what else is going on at USDA? That's all the legislative side. Um, so that's, that's the first part. Farm bulk part is legislative side. We also have the regulatory side. What happens at the agency or the department itself? Um, local administrative areas, that's a term used by um, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Those are now, or excuse me, um, FSA as well. USDA uses them for a variety of different programs. But those are now fully digitized and available on the USDA website. So you can take a look at those and see where those LAAs overlap with your tribal lands. And uh, one thing that I want everybody to be aware of, some of you may already know it, um, let me back up. I'm currently serving on the State Farm Service Agency Committee in Oklahoma, and one of the things that I have been pushing is educational resources to tribes to say, if you are a tribal citizen who lives within an LAA and your tribe has trust land in that LAA, you are eligible to vote for your um, county committee, your county FSA committee. You don't have to be a producer or a landholder you are considered a landholder of that trust parcel because you are a citizen of that tribe. You can show up and vote for who your county committee person is. You should also encourage your local tribal producers to run for the county committee so that we can have better representation for indigenous issues in front of the FSA at the county level. So um, nominations have already been out, but we're getting ready to start um, elections, so keep an eye out for that. You may have an opportunity to participate and help select who that next um, county committee person is going to be for your LAA area. Um, let's see, NRCS and BIA um, is talking about executing an MOU um, regarding BIA acceptance of NRCS land determinations to eliminate that duplicative review processes across agencies. <coughs> we hear this all the time. There's been a little bit of progress made, but we know there is a huge need for USDA to work 
better with BIA when it comes to land determinations. Um, I was up at Crow last year and I was talking to one of their um, USDA County employees and she was telling me that she'd been trying to get a producer signed up um, for a program or for a contract and they had to wait on BIA for two years to get the final acreage assessment finished before they could get over. And granted, this was started pre-pandemic, finished after pandemic, but in any instance, that's ridiculous. Um, the delay is a huge problem. And so we've had conversations about, you know, how do we address that? Is, you know, is there a time frame that we need to put on BIA? Like you only have so long, like 60 days to review it. And if you don't make a decision, it's deemed approved. Um, in order to really help producers get their land enrolled in these conservation programs or contract programs, they're gonna help put a little bit more dollars in their pocket or help improve the health um, of the land itself because we know there's a huge deficiency in conservation um, programs as they're applied to Indian country lands. So um, that's something that's in the works. Um, that existing BIA and USDA MOU, um, we're going to be taking a look at that. Um, USDA is going to be doing it internally, but we're also at IFAI are going to take a look at that and mark it up for updates or changes ourselves to say, this language is in here, it has good intent, but it hasn't been implemented because there's no guidance about it, so we need to be more specific, or we need to change the wording, or we need to just eliminate it because what good is having that information in there if it's not going to be used? So. Um, I don't like having words on paper that don't actually mean anything. Um, that's aggravating from somebody who, you know, wants to see programs actually be implemented rather than just say we're going to talk a good talk and not actually do it. Um, so we're going to be looking for that. Um, there's also been a request by the administrator of FSA for folks to take a look at the FSA handbooks and guidebooks and go through and make red lines about what's working and what isn't for Indian country to update those policies and procedures and provide additional clarification. Um, a lot of our FSA um, staff are still pretty unfamiliar with working in Indian country. There are some that are super familiar with it and do a really good job of it, but it's not consistent across the agency. So updating those guidebooks and handbooks will be helpful to kind of help fill in some of that gap. It won't address the whole problem, but at least we'll have improved documentation about how the process is supposed to work. Um, this is one I'm excited about, placing urban ag offices on tribal lands. But Carly, you just said we're a little more rural and a little more remote. Why would we want an urban ag office on tribal lands? Urban agriculture at USDA has a very broad and flexible definition. Um, that urban ag designation can sometimes mean small or very small production facilities. So if you are a part of a tribe that has a lot of allotted land or a lot of fractionated land where your parcels are small, you're talking like, you know, went through probate, did a partition, and you're having people with five and 10 acre parcels, but it's ag land, and they wanna do something with it, that urban ag office may be able to support that smaller scale agriculture that's gonna make more sense for that smaller allottee or that smaller fee land property holder there on reservation or within your community. So I like that one. That one's coming out of Senator Booker's office. We're keeping an eye on that. And then um, the APHIS, um, is looking at animal disease traceability regulation changes. And so that's pretty much ear tags for your livestock, um, scanning them, knowing where their origins are. And if there is like a foodborne disease outbreak, being able to identify the lots and isolate where those products came from so that they can be a little more cognizant about um, how to deal with that instead of having to do like widespread um, uh, moratoriums or widespread uh, product dumping or destruction or even livestock or poultry destruction because we know that a lot of those animal disease um, challenges can result in a lot of um, negative outcomes. Y'all heard about bird flu and there was so many people had to like uh, reduce their stock because of it because it's highly contagious. Traceability um, like this would hopefully address um, some of those challenges and issues. What else? So there's a soft foundation for this Office of Self-Government, uh, Self-Governance at USDA. Some of the pandemic legislation created um, specific funding opportunities in like conservation and forestry titles. And so uh, the director of tribal relations is trying to bring on more staff to kind of start helping to facilitate those direct administration opportunities for tribes. It's not officially 638, it's not officially self-governance, but it walks and talks like that per the um, IRA, the uh, Inflation Re Reduction Act and some of the other fundings that are coming through to support um, these particular programs. So 
we're looking at that kind of being something that will lay the foundation for, an op for a self-governance office at USDA. Um, the Equity Commission has made some recommendations and USDA provided a response. We have links to those on our IFAI website under our policy updates, so feel free to check that out. Um, the Heirs Property Relending Program, some of your tribes may already be participating in this. Um, that's intended to resolve those ownership and succession issues on farmland. Um, they are currently receiving applications for those if your tribe isn't doing it but wants to do it. Um, my tribe, Cherokee Nation, is currently participating in that program. Um, I don't have an update from them about how well it's working. Um, but I know that USDA is continuing to encourage and solicit tribes who wants to administer that. And it's not limited to tribes, there's other organizations that can administer that program as well. Um, let's see, the discrimination funds. Have you guys heard about the loan forgiveness opportunities based on um, uh, BIPOC uh, farmers and ranchers discrimination practices? So the widespread forgiveness um, was suspended because of a lawsuit. And so what's happening now is they're going through and reevaluating and identifying how to actually identify when discrimination has occurred and identifying that and creating a method to provide um, loan relief or funding opportunities for producers who have experienced that. And so right now, um, the vendors who are going to be administering those funds and addressing or you know, doing the calculation about how discrimination has occurred, they're selecting who those vendors are gonna be currently. And then also, uh, or they're gonna be announcing them soon. The USDA OPPE, um, the Advisory Committee on Minority Farmers, is going to be having a public meeting the 28th through the 30th. Um, that's available online and you can pre-register. That's a discussion about BIPOC, um, black indigenous and people of color um, producers, as well as I think women and disabled veterans um, and beginning farmers and ranchers um, can come and uh, talk about specific issues about how USDA can improve their service to those groups. So what's going on at DOI? Um, DOI currently has uh, comments open for a bison donation request program. They want to know, does this form that we want you to fill out look okay? Is it 13 pages? Is it 24 pages? Hopefully it's not more than three or four because that's a lot of paperwork for a bison donation. Um, the Intertribal uh, Buffalo Council has been collaborating. Uh, those comments were due March 16th and um, hopefully we'll get some um, updates and information on that. BIA is also proposing irrigation assessment rate changes, um, passing along assessments to users, and most of those are gonna be increased. Some are gonna stay the same, but if your tribe um, has irrigation assessments that are important or critical to them, I recommend taking a look at that. Those comments were due on the 20th, um, but it'd be a good idea to get some insight if there's gonna be any uh, uh, rate changes that are gonna impact your community or your less easier producers. Uh, DOI is also developing a policy on indigenous knowledge. There was a hearing in February, but we haven't heard any updates about where that is going. Um, they also have, um, are taking recommendations from the USDA Equity Commission and taking a look and seeing how BIA may be able to um, help fill some of those gaps. And then they had a request for comments on BIA grazing permit forms that were due on the 15th. So keep an eye out on that. Um, what's coming up? Land Acquisition Funding Distribution Listening Session, April 18th and 20th. Take, I would recommend um, somebody from your office or at your tribe attend that listening session and figure out um, what, what's going on here because the land acquisition funding, they're saying how do we need to distribute this? We have dollars available for tribes to support land acquisition. Who gets what? Is it gonna be competitive? How do we determine who, you know, what lands are available? Um, or identify for purchase that tribes can you know, pick up, um, how do you use that money? So that one's gonna be important to attend. Uh, there's also a public comment period. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Osage Nation or if any of you guys work there, but there's a huge challenge with the administration of the mineral estate. And I know that's been an ongoing, um, continuing challenge. Uh, BIA is proposing kind of a modernization, as they call it, of how the regs work. But to my knowledge, Osage is saying, how about you just let us self-administer all of it? And there's been some backlash there, but um, this is an example of BIA trying to clean stuff up in a way to moderate the challenge, um, when one of the biggest issues is it hasn't been sufficiently administered since the beginning, and I don't think the Osage Nation has faith in a lot of the BIA um, with regard to mineral estate management. And so I'm keeping an eye on this one to see how it shakes out because I think it could be indicative of other tribes that have mineral interest and in how those um, BIA administration policies are gonna go. Osage Mineral Interest Estate 
kind of operates and works a little bit differently. They have their own statute that kind of sets up how that's supposed to work, um, but it's good to keep an eye on just to be informed. And let's see. This is probably the biggest one that I've seen come out of DOI. Government-wide consultation about training modules, about how to work with tribal partners. This is gonna happen on April 17th from two to 4 p.m. You have to register online. I highly encourage anybody to attend this one because um, as a part of executive branch guidance, so that means this is coming from either the president or the secretary, so either President Biden or Secretary Holland is requiring federal staff, um, OP, uh, the Office of uh, Personnel Management and Department of Interior to have a consultation with tribal partners to discuss what training modules are needed for federal employees who are gonna be involved in the consultation process. We hear all the time, you guys aren't <coughs> consulting right, you're not giving us enough notice, um, you aren't listening to us when we're in consultation, uh, there are things that need to be improved, and so seeing that DOI is actively taking steps to get feedback about how consultation processes need to work when it comes to BIA and DOI regulations is critical. So if you have information or ideas about how uh, DOI can better do consultation processes, attend this, um, it'll be really important. So. This one, since it is a consultation, if you're gonna be representing your tribe, you either need to be an elected official or have a proxy to be able to represent. But there may be an opportunity for a listening session or an open comment period at the end. Um, that has to do with the legal definition between how information is protected through what's considered a consultation versus a listening session. So consultation has protections associated with um, the information that's shared by tribal leadership is not something that's discoverable through a Freedom of Information Act request that's um, is considered confidential and um, it's protected. If it's in a listening session, anybody can participate, um, tribal citizens, but that information is not protected and it is discoverable through a FOIA request. So um, there's just some different protections associated there, but it's really important to get that feedback and tell DOI and any other federal agency, if you wanna work with us through a consultation process, this is what needs to happen. Okay. This one makes me crazy. Okay. So there was an executive order issued that essentially directed the Department of Interior to put together um, information about um, what authorities can support tribal stewardship and co-stewardship of land and water and wildlife. And so they put this together and listed out all these different statutes. Um, you know, this allows for co-management, co-stewardship. This allows for direct management, direct stewardship. What do you think they left out? The American Indian Ag Resource Management Act, which facilitates ag resource management plans. Now, you're like, well, we have an IRMP. How's that any different? An IRMP is a game plan. It works well. An ARMP is authorized under IARMA, that American Indian Ag Resource Management Act, and it has teeth for sovereignty. It creates an opportunity for a tribe to say, these are our ag resource priorities. This is how we want to administer them. And it requires BIA to comply with your tribe's priorities. And it requires BIA to show up when your council says you need to get here and talk about why there hasn't been support or assistance. We've seen tribes take a look at um, addressing land management, um, uh, invasive species like feral horse management. This could be a huge tool um, to really address some of the challenges associated with that. Um, and then there's also opportunities that um, identify anything that a tribe would consider an agricultural resource and how to administer that. Can your youth be an ag resource? Sure. Can your existing producers be an ag resource? Why not? Um, your land, your water, uh, any other resources that you have that could be tied into agriculture, that IARMA is a vehicle for sovereignty where you have the ability to make the decision about how those uh, ag resources are administered or managed without BIA um, regulatory involvement. The only thing that they are able to be involved in if a tribe has a policy that's included in that ARMP is how to help enforce it. So I encourage you to check that out. There will be an ARMP presentation later this afternoon. Um, definitely take a look at that. So I'm irritated that they didn't include that because to me that is the biggest opportunity for tribal land management and stewardship uh, because it is a direct vehicle for tribal sovereignty over the land. Grazing leases, um, permitting, all that stuff. What's up, Jim? Yes, yeah, 
it is specific to BIA and DOI. It references the Secretary of Interior shall, not may, shall. So that's a good one. All right, let's talk about funding opportunities. There's a ton. Um, right now, USDA has a rural business cooperative service funding applications for VAPG, Value Added Producer Grants, um, up to $31 million in total. Um, those electronic apps are due May 11th, um, paper apps due May 16th. What's a Value Added Producer Grant? If you have a raw product, anything that you do with that raw product, so you have beef on, or you have a steers on the hoof that you want to process. Anything that it takes to get that product from on the hoof to on your plate is considered a value added, a value add um, opportunity. So um, it can be for produce, it can be for other types of you know, ag production, any type of processing equipment, um, aggregation, warehousing, storage, anything that increases the value of that product before it hits your plate or hits that final consumer opportunity, there is a really good grant funding opportunity for that. I like to encourage tribes to apply for this because a lot of times individual producers or even smaller um, producer groups can't afford the lift to get the equipment necessary that would really um, help that break even. Tribes, however, are in a really good position to acquire those funds and either uh, or acquire those uh, value added grants uh, for production to use it for their own operations, but also whatever capacity is available, offer that to your uh, tribal community, your tribal producers, or even local producers. So for an example, um, the scale is, is probably too big to qualify for one of these grants, but um, a tribe that has a meat processing facility, they may have their own herd, they'll put their own herd through first on that processing schedule, they have additional capacity available. They say, hey, who wants it next? We'll give you a discounted rate uh, if you're a tribal producer. If you're a youth producer, maybe we'll process uh, one or two head of your animals for free, um, especially if they're like you know, your show stock or something at the end of the season. Um, and then we also offer uh, competitive rates to non-native producers in the area. So that's a way to support your own tribe's um, operations support your local producers at a discounted rate so they can keep more money in their pockets, or your tribal producers, support your youth so they can get their operations going um, and not have a whole lot of overhead and continue to get into the field. And then also make money off of other people in your area who are more convenienced by being able to use that facility than having to go sell your stock at the, at the sale barn or you know just sell that raw product. Um, it creates opportunities for custom labeling. You can do aggregate contracting where your tribe says, we're gonna process all of this, uh, but we need more to fulfill this contract, so we're gonna buy everything that you wanna bring to us and we'll process it as well and get more dollars for that value-added product um, rather than selling everything at the raw product stage. So definitely check that one out. Um, there's also funding for socially disadvantaged groups. Um, that's only $3 million. That one's probably gonna be a little more competitive. Uh, there's also the emergency grain storage facility assistance for producers in the listed states. Um, but the ones that I wanna talk about are EQIP. Um, that's your alternative funding arrangement. Have you guys heard of that before? AFAs? Okay. An alternative funding arrangement is an opportunity um, to get into an agreement with the Natural Resource Conservation Service to get direct funding to administer for a project or a program. So maybe uh, there's something that you want to do that uh, may not necessarily be a direct fit for an EQIP practice, but you know it works really well, so EQIP is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program. There's a list of approved uh, practices that you can get reimbursement funding for. When your tribe enters into an alternative funding arrangement, they may say, okay, we have all this trust land and a lot of it's leased, but um, our lessees are not enrolling in EQIP, but we know there's a conservation need here. We want to administer um, these types of practices that are priority for us and instead of requiring all our individual lessees to enter into individual contracts or agreement, we as a tribe want to do one big one and we're going to provide support either by you know, providing the equipment or providing the labor or providing the materials um, and we're going to use the funding that we get from NRCS to directly administer those projects and priorities. That can work really well. AFAs are very flexible. There's a, that's not, that's just one example of how you can use them. So your local NRCS field agent um, or staffer or office staff may not be familiar with AFAs. There hasn't been guidance or um, directives issued about how they need to be administered. Um, but Gila River has one of the most successful AFAs and I talk about that one as an example. 
Um, there was an irrigation project where um, irrigation panels were installed to um, line the irrigation system to prevent um, leakage and evaporative loss um, in a more um, conservation friendly manner. So there's a wide variety of opportunities that you can request an alternative funding arrangement for, and I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, we're hopeful to see some ones get off the ground, uh, but that's a really good way to kind of say, well, this program doesn't exactly fit for me, but I have a really good idea about what we can do to use it. So instead of using the program, we're just gonna do an AFA and do it our way and make it work. The other thing that you can do if you're, there's a program that maybe the rules or regs aren't exactly the best fit for how your tribe holds land or what resource you wanna work on or what the eligibility requirements are, as a tribe, you can always request a waiver. We need a waiver from these rules or these regulations so we can access this program. And the Secretary of USDA has the authority to say, sure. And what that really means is your state conservationist um, has the ability to say, okay, yeah, we can do that because that authority trickles down to them. So check that out. Um, cooperative agreements are always a good way um, to take a look at administering programs or providing support within your tribal community, especially if those impacts or outreach efforts are gonna go even beyond that community. Um, outside of your reservation boundaries, um, maybe be impactful for that local community as well. And then I also want to give a shout out for the Native American Ag Fund. Um, take a look at their funding opportunities. If you want to involve youth, there's a, a set aside pot of money for youth programs. Um, they're really tasked with um, those investments in Indian country. Um, your tribe would be eligible to apply and they have technical assistance um, when you're working on getting your grant application put together. So definitely reach out to them. Uh, their funding cycle is coming up, I believe, next month. So keep an eye out for those. Okay. And also, uh, CREP, uh, Conservation Resource Enhancement Program. That's like a 638 opportunity that's administered by tribes. Uh, but most CRP lands, like once you get those enrolled, you can't touch them or use them for anything. Um, it's like, that's similar for the cropland, but for the grassland provision for CREP that tribes are encouraged to administer, you can graze that. So you can have your bison on that land, you can have your cattle on that land, you can graze that land and still be within the parameters of that program and receive a, um, I think it's somewhere between like 14 and $16 per acre um, for that. So if your tribe has, you know, broad lands that would benefit from enrolling that, um, that you could still use for grazing options. That'd be a really good way to put, you know, get a little bit of extra money in the pot um, to help those programs. All right, like I said, there's a ton of funding opportunities. Um, I know this is 2022, but it's current. Um, check out, this is the USDA resource guide for American Indian and Alaska Natives, and it lists all the programs at USDA that tribes are eligible to participate in, but not just tribes tribal organizations and tribal producers. Um, it gives you information about where, how to apply, what the eligibility requirements are, if there's a match requirement, um, what the funding range is, and um, all that's available on the USDA website. So if you Google um, American Indian USDA programs, this guide should come up for you. So, and there's a ton of good information in there, definitely check that out. All right. To back up, if you want to get involved in the Farm Bill, Native Farm Bill Coalition is hosting a series of fly-ins. As you can see, we've already done a few. The Midwest Tribe one is occurring right now, um, but we also have some coming up um, shortly after. So Northwest, Eastern, we're doing an all Indian country fly-in on May 9th and 10th, and there's gonna be a Native American food fair on the 11th at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, that's at the, the Smithsonian facility there in DC. Um, the June one is tentative. I know they're all marked tentative, but they're all set except for this Alaska one because there's a discussion about whether um, the congressional staffers um, want to maybe meet in Alaska because it's easier for people to get there than it is in the Alaska region instead of going all the way to DC. So keep an eye on that one. But what does the flying consist of? You come in, you meet with Native Farm Bill Coalition staff, we'll brief you. We spend the morning at uh, NIGA, the National Indian Gaming Association, they generously donated their space, and you'll get briefed on what the schedule looks like, um, identify what your top priorities are, and what your talking points are going to be on them. Um, you don't have to show in there and just, you know, recite all the Native Farm Bill Coalition priorities. You get to talk about what's important for your tribe. Um, that is usually fine on a Monday, um, briefing on Tuesday, uh, hill visits Tuesday afternoon, all day Wednesday, and then Thursday morning and then you fly home Thursday. 
there is a limited amount of travel scholarship or support available. If you go to nativefarmworld.com backslash fly-in, um, they have links at each of the um, fly-ins that are listed, and you can sign up and request travel support or assistance if you need that. Um, we definitely encourage uh, tribal elected officials to attend. We definitely want to see tribal producers attending. Or if you are a subject matter employee who's working in a program that's funded by USDA or touches on agriculture, nutrition, or natural resources, um, or any sort of program that the Farm Bill would touch, definitely consider signing up for that as well. Um, we'd love to see you there, and if you have questions, you can holler at me afterwards. And then, um, Bo, the cards, are they on the back table? They're right here. Okay. Yep. Um, if you want more information about that, um, uh, IAC, who's one of the Native Farm Bill Coalition partners, um, we have uh, cards printed that give information about the fly-ins and the links, so you can grab one of those and have that link available and follow up later if you want to. So, all right, questions. And first I have to point out, we were at Death Valley last week for spring break and my husband took that picture of me coming out of the Slot Canyon. He did a really good job, huh? Yeah. Okay. I talked a lot. That was an info dump. What questions can I answer for you? So Jim had a question about uh, land acquisition that was being offered through uh, DOI. Um, the question was, is it only available for tribes or is that something that tribes could extend to individuals for land acquisition? I do not know the answer to that. Um, that would be something good to attend that listening session and find out. So I would recommend checking that out. But good question, Jim. I'm going to give you the lawyer answer. I don't know, but I can try and look it up and get the info to you later. Yes. Any hemp updates? Um, hemp was not something that we heard about quite frequently when we did our stakeholder outreach. Um, to my knowledge, uh, I haven't seen any marker bills come through where hemp has been a centralized focus that have received any um, amount of noticeable consideration. Um, I think from the regulatory side, there may be some um, updates coming with regard to um, testing and enforcement practices. Um, I know there's been some discussion about how to um, better support uh, tribes that are engaged in hemp production in uh, what the testing protocols look like, you know, field testing versus lab testing, and that threshold um, being so low. But I know that even with that low THC threshold, that um, there was significant flexibility for that uh, testing um, parameter. So they give you flex, like you're supposed to hit like under 0.03 THC, but there's like a window of if you're a little bit over, they're going to be flexible with you on it, but it's not much. And so they're taking a look and saying, okay, do we really need to crack down and make it, you know, consistent definitely at that 0.03 because there's variability in those field tests that can occur sometimes, especially when you're supposed to be testing, what, 10 days before harvest or something like that. So that can be really tough um, to be compliant with because what if it rains right before harvest? Do you have to redo your tests and do you have to wait? Are you waiting for your hemp to rot in the field before you harvest it to be compliant with those, you know, testing parameters? So. Um, those are some of the discussions that are being had right now, but I don't have any specific information about what the outcome is going to look like there. All right, last call for questions. I know I just dumped so much info on you, your guys' heads are just exploding. Okay, if you want to catch me afterwards, I'll be around. Um, Wado, thank you so much for coming. Um, I think we probably finished a little bit early, so I'll hang out. Um, but thank you for coming, and good luck to you, and we would... Uh, love for you to participate in a fly-in, or if your tribe is interested in joining the Native Farm Bill Coalition, um, come visit with me about that. Native Farm Bill Coalition membership is only open to tribes. Um, we also have uh, Native um, organization partners, intertribal association partners, and um, some nonprofits. But right now, we're only accepting new memberships um, from tribal um, from tribes themselves. So, feel free to holler at me, Wado Donodago Ha'i, and have a good rest of your conference.